So let's talk about the future of legacy. I'm just going to read the, the uh, slide that's on the screen. As we continually update the operating characteristics of legacy and add more and more play value into our world, we look forward to integrating smart tablets and smart phones into the operating world of legacy. The basis of this expansion is the new LCS Wi-Fi device, which creates an access point into the world of legacy. To support these smartphones and tablets, we needed to increase the communication rate of the ASC series of devices. To accomplish this, we've gone from the standard two-wire command-based cable to the new high-speed PDI, Packetized Data Interface Cabling System. The PDI cables allow faster communication on your layout's network of devices, such as the new sensor track, this Wi-Fi device, ASC2, BPC2, and so on. I do want to add a comment here that the Wi-Fi device is not a required component of this new LCS high-speed network on your layout. You can operate your layout with legacy, replacing older discontinued items with the newer uh, acronym series items with the, uh, that, that are uh, preceded with the number two. So like the ASC from TMCC1 is now replaced by ASC2. Um, it uses the PDI cables. And in just a few slides, I'll show you how all of that ties in together. But basically, your, um, your Wi-Fi device is not a requirement of legacy. It's only a requirement if your consumer wants to use an iPad app or an iPhone app or some other uh, Android device to have access into the network. Having next access into the network means that you have access to the legacy base. Some of you may or may not have heard a rumor. I want to put that rumor at rest and let you know what the facts actually are. Back in January, Lionel made an announcement that we were going to open the protocol of legacy. And what that basically means is that third-party developers, guys that develop uh, applications for smartphones and smart tablets, can sign a licensing agreement with Lionel. That allows them to gain access to all of our 9-bit legacy commands in terms of how they look, in terms of ones and zeros. That allows that third-party developer to create an application that allows the end user to control the trains on their on their layout using the legacy system, using TMCC, and ultimately if that developer chooses, they can then access the DCS world, the MTH world of things. And so by us taking this step of licensing our technology and creating this Wi-Fi device, we basically create the Wi-Fi data access point for the uh, high-speed interface between legacy and DCS and then, of course, all of our LCS devices as well. So the rumor is true. We have, we have uncopyrighted that, uh, that software and that protocol, and we are offering that, uh, those protocols up to any third-party developer who wants to sign a licensing agreement with us. And finally on this slide, at Lionel, we take the philosophy of no train left behind very seriously. What does this mean? As I stated in the beginning, it means everything we have made since the introduction of TMCC in 1995 to date is compatible with legacy. An example of some of these new devices I mentioned earlier are on this slide I'm about to show you. So here's the LCS Wi-Fi module. As I said, this creates a wireless access point to your layout's high-speed communication network. It allows you to use smart tablets and smartphone applications to control every aspect of your layout with a visual interface on the smartphone, smart tablet screen, something that we're not able to accomplish with the legacy remote. As I stated earlier, the Wi-Fi device is definitely not a required component of the system. It's simply another tool that allows the end user to take their layout further. The next new device we have that you've seen cataloged and is currently on the water, should actually be here about the middle of June, is the new sensor track. The consumer can add one to several of these tracks to their layout 
to add some serious play value to their railroad empire. Sensor tracks are capable of so much, and I put that in there because there's not enough slides to keep everybody awake and explain what's happening here with sensor track. But trust me when I tell you this thing is capable of some incredible things. From automatically updating your legacy system with locomotive information, which has formerly been accomplished with the orange memory modules, to automatic train and sound control. Each sensor track has the ability to record up to 500 individual commands and play them back every time that particular locomotive or every locomotive crosses the sensor track. The sensor track is smart enough to detect whether the train is moving from right to left or left to right. And it, you can program it to tell it to play the recording only when you go left to right or vice versa. You can command all of the locomotives to uh, blow the FRA grade crossing signal, which would be two longs, a short, and a long horn blast every time a locomotive gets to a grade crossing. The, the possibilities of this, of this sensor track, and even more so multiple sensor tracks in a layout, is going to be, uh, is going to be pretty awesome. Um, this tied in with the new LCS, the layout control system, uh, apps that the engineering guys are working on um, allows you to do some pretty amazing things with your trains that you've never been able to do before. But since this isn't a sales pitch, I'll keep going. The next new device that we have up is the serial converter. The serial converter is designed to slow down the communication on this new high-speed network so that it gives you 100% compatibility with the older acronym style devices. The Serial 2 also allows interfacing with the MTH DCS track interface unit to the high speed network. Once again, going back to what I was saying about that Wi Fi device, with the Wi Fi access point to the, to the uh, network on your layout, having a Serial 2 device in there to slow that communication down to the TIU allows those third party guys to be able to create a singular operating platform for. DCS, Legacy, and TMCC all blended together. Um, you can also use a Serial 2 to slow down the high-speed communication so it works with Dennis Zander's uh, Z-Stuff, uh, uh, DZ2500 switch machines, and any other accessories. I haven't been following what Dennis does for the last few years, but anything that communicates on his DZ2500 data line can be driven off this Serial 2. The uh, next new device out is the PDI starter cable. Only one PDI starter cable is required per layout. This is the cable that connects your legacy base to the high-speed network, or the PDI cabling system, and provides a required voltage to support reliable communication. At some point in the past, you may have heard from a customer about how the uh, the computer port on a legacy base would only drive a certain number of uh, acronym devices because the, uh, the amperage behind the signal was lower than what it was on the TMCC1 base. This 12-volt power supply here fixes that problem forever moving forward. So with the, uh, with the advancement of this higher speed communication, we're also able to go back and fix some of these problems that were presented to us previously. So the PDI starter cable connects to your legacy base, and it has one of those PDI connectors on the end. If you look at the serial converter photo on the top, on the bottom side of the serial 2 device, on the left-hand side, there's two rectangular off-white connectors. That's where the PDI cable plugs in. And then your next cable plugs into the connector on the right and runs to the left side of the next device, and so on and so on. All these PDI cables are available in standard 1 foot, 3 foot, 10 foot, and 20 foot standard lengths, and all five of these cables are currently in stock at Lionel. And uh, that basically covers the screen I just talked about. There's your uh, part numbers for your four different lengths of PDI cables, and then 81499 is the, is the starter cable. 